Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, we will get started here in just a minute. Thank you everyone for joining on a Wednesday afternoon. Hello, welcome everyone. We'll get started shortly. I see folks coming into the Zoom room. We'll get started here just in a bit. All right, looking good on Facebook too. I see a few people watching on Facebook, welcome. And I appreciate everyone showing up on time. We do have quite a few registrants today. So we're gonna give folks just another minute or so to, to come in and join us. Great, maybe in the meantime, if people wanna share in the chat, like where they're watching from, it's always cool to see where people are tuning in from today, like what area of Portland or if you're from outside, put that in the chat or the Facebook comments, it'd be cool to see. That'd be great. Central Valley of California. Ooh. Ontario, Canada. Yeah, we've got some folks turning, or some, we've got Multnomah County, Central California. That's cool. I think it's really fun to see because with something virtual, you never know. It's mm -hmm. very true. Well, I think I'll um, get us started just by saying hi, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. Um, this is part of an ongoing series of workshops since the pandemic, uh, bringing you topics and resources that you'd usually find at in-person fix affairs, which are really broad topic community events, community resource events brought to you by the city of Portland, Oregon. And since the pandemic started, we moved a lot of our stuff online but uh, this fall, we hope to uh, start our in-person events again uh, as we knew them before the pandemic. But good news also, we do intend to have some online workshops still as well. So we're pursuing a hybrid model. Um, my name is Wing. I'm one of the co-coordinators of the Fix Affairs, uh, again, through the city of Portland, Oregon. And I'm very excited to have with us today the Smaltnoma Soil and Water Conservation District here to talk about creating an edible landscape. Thank you so much for joining. Take it away. Great, thank you so much, Wang. We're really happy to be with the Fix It Fair. My name is Tiffany Mancius. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator with uh, East Multnomah Sun Water Conservation District. I just wanna share a little bit about we, like the work we do and what that looks like, and then introduce our incredible presenter today. Um, so East Multnomah Sun Water Conservation District we're actually a government organization, but we're non-regulatory. So that means we don't make the laws specifically, you know, pertaining to the work. We're not creating laws around environment, but what we're, we are able to do is actually help folks create a more sustainable landscape within Portland and some of the greater areas. So what that looks like is it kind of grew out of the Dust Bowl actually, when a lot of farmers, some folks are really doing some landscape practices that were not so sustainable and very dangerous to people's livelihoods. And so since then, um, that's evolved in a lot of different ways. And one of the things that we do is provide free workshops on a variety of topics. So this one's kind of gardening, we have sustainable land management, edible landscapes. And today's a shorter version of a workshop that we actually have a two and a half hour one that's also with Lydia, our presenter. And so if you want more information or if you like what you're seeing here, you can actually go to our website for additional resources. 
handouts, links, and we work with experts in our field. So we're able to get you the best information all for free. Um, so today I'm gonna introduce right now, um, one of the incredible experts we work with. We contract with Lydia Cox, who's an educator, landscape designer. And Lydia's specialty is to empower people to actually grow their own food at home and to show you what that looks like. So I'm gonna pass it over to Lydia. And as you continue going through this webinar, as we keep going, please put questions in the chat. We're here live and the benefit of that is that you get to ask those questions. So, all right, take it away, Lydia, thanks. Great, thank you so much for the introduction, Tiffany. I'm super happy to be here today with all of you and to share this information about how you can grow food in your own um, space, whether that is your landscape, whether you have a balcony with some container space, whatever scope you have, I want you to be, uh, be able to walk away with some tips for how you can start growing your own food at home. And as Tiffany mentioned, this is a shortened version of the two and a half hour workshop that we do. So please do ask questions because we're not gonna be able to cover everything that we cover in the longer version. Um, but what I'd like to do is have you walk away with um, some, some energy, some excitement, some inspiration for how you can start incorporating food in your landscape. And so here's how we're gonna do that. We're gonna talk about a few different distinct types of edible plants how you can make an educated decision and where to place it within your growing space or your landscape, and then also give some tips and tricks for how you can create a whole ecosystem around your, your garden or your food forest or your food growing space so that it can be as healthy and robust as possible. So let's dive right in. So I like to start and just kind of bring us all back to why we might be here, why we might be taking this course. And for most of us, the easy answer is we want to eat fresh food and we want to know how our food is grown. We want to know what goes into the food that we're going to be eating. We want to know, you know, how it's, it's grown and, and what uh, we might be getting from that food nutrition wise. And a lot of us also want to use, as, use it as a chance to get to know how food is grown in the first place. We, a lot of us have been very removed from our food system. So this is a great way to connect back to our food systems and nature and really just see that whole circle of life through growing food at home. Um, and then one thing I like to call out because I think it's very important but often overlooked is that growing food uh, at home is often a great way to build resiliency in our communities. And I am going to speak primarily to folks who are living more in that close-knit kind of urban community. That's sort of the template I use for talking about how you might want to transform your landscape. But know that everything I talk about can scale to larger sites or smaller sites. Um, but that's really kind of that sweet spot where we we want to build that resiliency, build up the knowledge that different people in your neighborhood have to grow food and be able to really kind of uh, create an even more local food system than you may already have. So this is what we're going to cover today. Um, we'll go ahead and jump right in because it's a lot. So before we start talking about specific plant types, I want to introduce an idea because I'm going to use it and reference it kind of throughout the rest of this talk. And it's the idea of breaking up your landscape into different zones. And the reason this is helpful is because if you are growing different food crops or different types of plants that produce food, you want to make sure that you're putting them in the right space for the plant to thrive and in the right space for you to be able to give that plant Plant, what it needs to give you a good harvest. And so generally, again, kind of thinking about that typical urban lot. Um, so you've got some space, but maybe you don't have acreage. Most spaces like that, you're going to have about three zones. You're going to have the first zone, which are places within your landscape that you are interacting with more or less on a daily basis. So I'll give you some more examples when we look at all three zones, but these are the things that you either see up close, you have your hands on, you're passing through these spaces within your landscape pretty regularly. Your zone two, no. Oops, there we go. Uh, your zone two is gonna be something, uh, a space that maybe you spend a little bit of time during the week, but you really, you kind of ignore it part of the time. So maybe that is a part of your landscape where you really only spend time there over the weekend. That would be a good example of what we would consider a zone two. 
And a zone three in this example would be um, a spot in your landscape that pretty much gets ignored. Maybe you're out there kind of looking at the plants or um, just physically moving through that space once a month or so, but it's really the space that gets the least amount of attention. And the reason this is important when we're looking at growing food is because different types of food crops or different types of edible perennial plants are gonna need different amounts of attention, of um, you know, care when it comes to pest and disease, to harvest time and harvest uh, methods. So this is just one way to really start um, creating an educated map of your space so that you can really set yourself up for success. So using this idea of zones, we're gonna go ahead and talk through a variety of different um, types of edible plants and where you might wanna place them both within those zones and other considerations to take into account. So often when we're talking about growing food at home, we think immediately of those annual veggies and fruits. So something that you, you know, you plant and it grows and you harvest it and it's gone more or less within one growing season. Those are generally considered annuals. Um, it's all those great crops like beans and summer squash and tomatoes, peas, all of that good stuff. Those would be considered annual crops. So these are really best suited when you're thinking of your overall landscape in that zone one, because these are the plants where we're really demanding a lot. We are asking them to go from either a seed or a very young plant all the way to the point of maturity where we can harvest some, you know, luscious, bountiful, nutritious food from. And so this often means that they have higher pest pressure, um, just like us, a lot of the pests that we have that are going to munch on your veggies, like, you know, tender greens, and they like um, things that are, are fresh and kind of at their peak. So these plants naturally have kind of a big window where they might be a little more prone to those pests. So we really want to make sure we're putting them in a spot where we can keep our eyes and our hands on these plants to give them the care they need. Now, one thing I, I didn't mention, and I want to mention mentioned this and I'll probably reiterate a couple times, is the zones are really to help you in making sure that things are placed in a way that is going to work with how you already interact with your landscape. The most important thing, however, for plants is to figure out how much sunlight they need because if your zone one is full shade, I'm not saying that you should grow your tomatoes there. Tomatoes need full sun. That might be an opportunity where you're going to be pushing those out into a zone two, hopefully not a zone three, but I think even if you don't have the proper sun in those spaces that you interact with most closely, the idea of zones helps because it really tells you, okay, here's the responsibility I have for this particular type of uh, food producing crop. And so even if you're pushing things out into a sunnier spot in zone two, kind of shift the way you think and say, you know, I really need to be visiting this space more frequently um, because I know that this is what these types of plants need. So just a little aside there. Um, so Annuals generally are going to have a dedicated space as well where you can kind of turn over those crops either multiple times uh, in the season or at least once a season. Um, it's not usually uh, super easy or helpful to have um, too many annuals and perennials mixed together. So perennials we're going to talk about in a minute, but those are the types of plants where you plant them once and that, that particular plant is going to live for multiple years and hopefully produce food for you for multiple years. And so it can be a little challenging if you mix annuals and perennials in the same bed. So um, because you're going to be disturbing the soil somewhat when you are changing over your annuals and you don't want to disturb those long lived long term perennial plants. So that's something else to consider when you're looking um, at what you're going to plant where. If you do want to integrate, this is kind of a little design tip. If you do want to integrate some annual plants within your perennials, for example, if you have a perennial herb garden that has, you know, all of those great Mediterranean herbs that live for years, like rosemary and sage and lavender, and you want to maybe include something like basil or parsley or cilantro, a really nice way to do that design-wise and functional functionality-wise is to have a few spots where you have containers placed within that perennial space, that perennial bed, and then those can be your little dedicated areas where you put those annuals so you're not also just disturbing the soil around those perennials. So that's just a quick tip design-wise. Um, but so then what we're going to want to look at next 
kind of uh, goes both directions. These can be annual or they can be perennial. It really just depends on what the specific plant is. And those are herbs and edible flowers. So I kind of touched on that um, with the example of having a perennial herb garden where you're also incorporated incorporating dedicated container space within that perennial bed with those annual herbs, you can see how there's overlap. It just depends on whether or not they can survive our winters and live for multiple years or not. Um, but it's really, really great to see this as an opportunity to start expanding the, the edible quality of your landscape beyond just a dedicated raised or in-ground annual veggie bed. This is really where you get to start picking some really interesting and fun plants that are going to stick with you for a longer term Term if they're perennial and can really start existing outside of that zone one, that kind of precious space where you're putting most of your time and attention. These are plants where you can start pushing them further out into your landscape because they are, um, you know, often lower pest pressure plants. Um, in this example, on the right hand side, we have rosemary and we have sage, and those are both really wonderful, attractive, um, really beneficial plants that really don't need to be, um, you know, kind of coddled or babied. They're drought resistant. They're really tough. And so they're a great option if you want to start adding more edible plants out further into your landscape in that zone two or that zone three, where they're still going to be able to thrive without you having to dedicate that kind of daily attention to. And so what that does is that then opens up that more annual precious zone one space for herbs or edible flowers that are annuals and might need a little more attention. So again, on this slide, we're looking on the left hand side at an edible flower called nasturtium. And nasturtium is really wonderful. Those beautiful, big, bold flowers are completely edible. In fact, the entire plant is edible and it has a nice kind of black pepper taste to it. So it's not, you know, it's not usually something that you'd think of when you think of like those little um, sugared flowers on cakes. This is much more of something you can throw in a salad. You can use to garnish uh, an entire dish. Really, really great annual edible flower but you really want to put it more in a zone one because it is a little more prone to things like aphids, um, but it's a really easy one to kind of pull out if you have an aphid issue with that nasturtium, pull it out, start another round of them because they're really beneficial in your garden and they're edible. So you can see how um, I think this is a category of edible plant that is really underutilized in the greater landscape. I think most of us don't realize that we can actually um, look at and incorporate um, the these different parts of our food forest or our edible garden um, and, and not have to dedicate all of our zone one space to, to everything that we eat and have just ornamentals beyond that. So then we're kind of pivoting and looking at um, some options for perenni perennial edible plants. And primarily I'm looking now at fruiting shrubs, fruiting ground covers, um, things where we're gonna eat different parts of the plant, but they are gonna stick around again for years to come. And so this is another spot where you can really start expanding out into other parts of your um, landscape and even in really highly visible parts of your landscape. For example, blueberries, artichoke, um, huckleberry, those are all really attractive plants that are perennials. So you invest in them once, plant them, and they'll provide for you for years to come. But they're attractive enough plants that you could easily put them in the front yard and add some curb appeal. Um, artichoke, for example, design-wise, is a really kind of architectural plant. Um, it has a very contemporary kind of modern look to it. And so it's a really fun one, I think, to play with in kind of your more highly visible areas so that, you know, folks passing by it might catch their eye and they might not realize at first. And then when you look a little closer, think, oh my gosh, that's an artichoke growing on this, you know, three, four foot plant. Um, so I think this is the other big design opportunity is look for those perennials that are not going to be really fussy and that are going to be really attractive so that you can start having some of your food growing space to be a little more public 
facing, that'll really open up the opportunities for you as well, because then you're not restricted to just the areas in your landscape that aren't public facing. Um, and then the flip side is just kind of get to know your perennials. Raspberries are an excellent perennial fruiting cane, um, low maintenance uh, plant that you should have. They, however, don't look as pretty when they're not kind of at their peak ripeness. Um, so they might be one to kind of tuck over into a sunny little stretch of your side yard or your backyard. Um, so we can't go too far into detail with the, the actual ins and outs of each different perennial, but the takeaway I want for you to have is to get to know, number one, what um, crops and what plants do you actually enjoy eating? What do you find yourself buying from the grocery store? And then once you have sort of a short list of those, look at what those plants actually look like year round. And are they a good candidate for you to put in like a zone two, for example, a front yard, a backyard that you can really create a beautiful space that's also edible. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there for that. Um, so another thing that comes to mind when we think about, especially when we think about something like a food forest, um, which the idea of a food forest is really that you are just layering different plants that are either edible or they are supportive to those other edible plants. And we're going to talk about companion planting a little later. Um, but fruit trees, of course, come to mind right away when we think about a food forest or a layered edible landscape. And it's really important when you're considering adding um, a fruit tree in particular to your landscape that you want to think about a couple things. You want to think about how much maintenance does this tree need because um, it does vary. There's kind of a spectrum of, of needs when it comes to fruit trees. There are some that are, are pretty much hands off except for when it comes time to harvest. Those would be things like persimmon and fig, um, quince. Those tend to not have all that many um, issues. In fact, the biggest issue with things like figs and persimmons is really just having like birds and squirrels trying to take the fruit when it's ripe, um, but they don't have a lot of pests otherwise. And then there's, you know, the other end of the spectrum where you might have, you know, apples and pears and, and um, plums and things that might need a little more attention throughout the year. They still would be a good candidate for that zone three where you don't have to pay attention to them every single day, but you're going to want to know what times of the year does this need some excuse me, some special attention. Um, and is that compatible with my schedule with kind of how I, um, how I know my time is going to ebb and flow throughout the year. So for example, if you want to grow an apple tree, that's great. Fantastic crop grows really well here, but we also have some very distinct pests that have also grown to love apples that grow here. And so um, whenever I'm talking to someone who wants to grow apples, you want to know that June is a really big month of the year when you're going to want to have some extra special attention on your apples. June is when you're going to notice that your fruit is actually really starting to um, develop your, uh, you know, your little uh, fruits that have been successfully pollinated are going to be growing to about the size of a ping pong ball or so. And that's how you can really start seeing how much pollination you had that year and how much fruit the tree is starting to set. But two big things happen in June when we're looking at apple trees. One is that you want to make sure that you are taking into consideration that it's about to be time for pests to, there's a few particular moths um, to come and they're going to want to lay their egg and then that becomes a problem because the egg hatches and their little young burrows into the fruit and that can cause it to be um, not a great harvest. And so if you know ahead of time that you really want to do an apple and you've got some time in June that you can set aside each year that you can go out there and you can protect that young fruit before that, um, that pest population moves in, you're going to really set yourself up for success. The other thing that you're going to want to do with apples in particular is that same period of time, you're actually going to want to thin the fruit out. And it sounds really difficult to do. Nobody wants to throw away fruit before it's even developed, but it really is going to behoove you to make Make sure that that plant can actually support the amount of fruit that it is developing over the season, both physically, you don't want to break any branches, but also the quality of your fruit is going to go up the fewer fruit that you have on the plant because it can only put so much energy into its fruit for that season. And so the best rule of thumb for thinning out your apples in particular is 
everywhere that you have a little growth um, point, a little fruit spur, um, where you have, you might have like a cluster of multiple apples starting to develop, you should really get down to just one apple left at each of those little fruit spurs. And you really just kind of break off the ones that look smaller, like they're not forming as quickly and leave the healthiest, biggest one. And so I kind of go through all that detail to give you an idea of how you are not only going to want to consider, well, what do I like eating, but you're also really going to want to consider what does this particular um, edible plant need from me at what time and is that compatible? And if it is, then that's great and move forward and find a spot within your landscape for that particular plant. And if it's not a good fit for you, then maybe look at some different plants or in this case, some different fruit trees that might be a lower, lower maintenance fruit tree or might need attention at a different time in the year. Um, okay, so then of course, we have some really excellent Pacific Northwest native plants that offer edible, um, in this case, we're looking at fruiting plants, um, but are really wonderful additions to your edible landscape. Not only are they really well adapted to our soils and to our weather patterns already, um, but they're also excuse me, going to be something that even if you don't keep up with harvesting them, we have a ton of uh, native wildlife that are well adapted to take advantage of any of the excess fruit that you have growing. So they're kind of a dual purpose. You can harvest from them and get a crop, but you can also use it as a habitat plant to support native birds and things like that. So these are just a few examples of some of our native plants that have um, edible qualities. And I like to mention that when you are looking at the overall kind of design or layout of your landscape, um, get to know the habit, the growth habit of that particular native plant because some of them are really vigorous because they are well adapted here and they kind of have their, their preferred style of growth is to maybe even form like a thicket. So instead of you, you put in one plant and it just stays put, some of these natives really want to just start filling space because that's what they like to do when they're in the right conditions. And as long as you know that ahead of time, you can plan the appropriate amount of space and that also helps you kind of plan ahead and know what type of what volume of crop you might get. And so in this example on this slide, I would say that the um, thimbleberry, which is in the top right, and the salmonberry, which is in the bottom left, those are both examples that if you plant even just, you know, one or two plants of each of those, they're really going to kind of fill out and take up quite a bit more space than that starting plant because they like to form a little thicket. Whereas if you want something that um, really stays put, maybe you have a much smaller space, you really need to conserve space, then you're going to want to pick something like the evergreen huckleberry, the Oregon grape, or salal. Those are all going to be a little more predictable. They're not going to, um, you know, send out a bunch of shoots and create a thicket in the same way or the same speed that something like a thimbleberry would. Um, so that's just a little tip when you start looking at these Pacific Northwest natives, kind of know what its habit is so that you can give it the space it needs. Okay, so we've covered quite a few different types of plants. Like I said, we're really just kind of scratching the surface, but I want to go ahead and move on to soil and water because in addition, or I would say no matter which type of edible plant you're growing, one of the most critical things is going to be your soil and your soil life. And that's what's going to help make sure that you are starting to build um, a really healthy space to grow your food in. And you're also reducing any need that you're going to have to have a ton of extra inputs like fertilizers to grow your food. Because if you have really healthy soil, then your food is going to have access to the nutrition that's already in that soil. So let's kind of talk about that. So this is this is kind of just a, a rough um, way to start thinking about your soil. And what this is representing, this pie chart is showing us that there are really two main um, kind of tangible elements to your soil, which are the mineral components, kind of what we think about when we talk about dirt. It's like those are the, the sand and the silt and the clay particles that make up the bulk of our soil. Um, these are things that have different properties. These play a huge role in how our, our soil drains. So most of us, well, and I, 
I see we're kind of all over the place for this particular presentation. If you're in the Pacific Northwest, in the Portland, Oregon region, most of us have pretty heavy clay soil if it hasn't been amended um, or changed from kind of what, what we get naturally here. And so clay is a really fine, fine particle. And when it compacts, it can drain really slowly. So clay in and of itself is actually a great thing to have in your soil, but it can be a little problematic if it's really compacted or if there's not enough organic matter to kind of break up those clay particles and help retain moisture and nutrition. And on the flip side, if you have a really sandy soil, that water is just going to drain straight through because those are really big particles in, you know, in the grand scheme of soil size. Um, and they're big enough that you're, you're just not going to have the chance for water and nutrition to kind of stick around very well. And so the same solution to breaking up your clay is actually for um, sandy soils where you need to retain water and nutrition in the soil, excuse me, you want to add organic matter. So you can kind of see here the big thing to take away when you're thinking about soil, actually not the biggest, we're going to talk about that next, but one of the biggest is the mineral makeup of your soil is gonna help determine how it drains. And pretty much no matter what you do, you wanna make sure that you're adding some organic matter on a regular basis, because that is what's gonna kind of make your soil the best it can be for growing really healthy crops. It's gonna help retain moisture, but not too much. It's gonna help hold on to nutrition long enough for plants to take it up. And really importantly, it's gonna feed the life in your soil. And the life in your soil, meaning the microbes, the bacteria, the fungi, the worms, the beetles, those are what are going to be breaking down materials to make them available for plants to take up. So really important to know that, you know, you don't need to be planting in just 100% compost. That's not what we're looking for, but you want that to be a critical part of your soil. And so the other thing I want to point out on this slide is the other part of, of what kind of represents your soil is air and water. And I'm not asking you to go out and just start like pumping air into your soil or anything like that. What this means is that you want a variety of pore spaces within your soil so that you can capture and hold air and water. Because even roots need air pockets to do gas exchange. Um, a lot of plants will need oxygen and things like that. So you, that's what you don't want really waterlogged soil for most plants the roots really can't survive well in that. And so what this is representing is that you want that mix where you have not just fine particles like only clay, not just large particles like only sand. You really want a mix of the two that is bound together by organic matter and by the soil life. So soil life, that is actually the biggest thing in your soil. <clears throat> excuse me, if you're wanting to, especially if you're wanting to create an organic garden, a garden where the inputs are very few and the success and thriving nature of your plants is really high. It's all about feeding and supporting your soil as an ecosystem that supports life. And here's how we would do that. So to build that healthy soil, you're going to want to make sure, like I said, that you are contributing um, organic matter. And organic matter is really just anything that was once alive and is now dead and breaking down. So the easiest way to think about that is you have a pile of leaves, you shred them up, you set them aside, they kind of sit there for a few months and they really start breaking down. That's organic matter. Um, most compost that you can either purchase or make yourself at home, that is largely organic matter that you've put together in a pile, microbes and bacteria and other things have kind of shredded those down and turned them into a finer material. And that goes into your soil to help make sure that the plants can actually take up the nutrition that's in there. And so this is the cycle that you can look at um, when you're thinking about what's going on under the surface of the soil. And so as long as you are maintaining that soil life by giving it the food it needs, that organic matter that it needs, and making sure also a few other things like you don't want it to, you know, dry out completely. Um, if you have, you know, if you ever see in the summer that you've got sections of your landscape where it's just that really cracked hard clay, that is a prime example of a spot where you should really put some compost or at least 
place some mulch to protect that soil, to retain moisture, and really invite that life back into that soil, because that's a really harsh condition if, if things are drying out to that point. But if you have organic matter mixed into that mineral component, you're going to be able to retain moisture through that cycle of all of those, um, those living creatures breaking it down. Um, and so a really easy way to add organic matter, and I think this is often overlooked, so I think this is, I would call this a hot tip. I didn't make it up myself, but I would think this is something that a lot of people overlook, is that one of the easiest ways to consistently add organic matter to your soil, especially when you're looking at like annual raised veggie beds or, or in-ground veggie beds, is to leave the roots of your plants in the soil. So if it's the end of the season or if it's just the end of the season for a particular crop, instead of pulling that whole plant out, roots and all, cut it at the base, just cut um, right below the soil surface, leave that root system in your soil, if you're starting to plant something else immediately, just kind of adjust your plans enough that you can, you know, plant your seeds or plant your starts to one side or the other of that root system, but let that root system break down in the soil and it will immediately be a boost of organic matter that all of that soil life can take advantage of. And I think a lot of us kind of get it in our heads that we have to just like clean up every little scrap of any crop that we have in there, but then we're basically taking out organic matter that's already there ready to break down and then we end up having to go and import some other type of compost in. So if nothing else when we come when it comes to soil I really encourage you to start experimenting with that and letting your roots die in place. The only exception would be if you know that you have some sort of um, you know soil borne disease with that crop then you should take the whole root system out but I would say you know eight nine times out of ten those crops are going to be perfectly fine and healthy and they can break down in place. Um, okay, so then we want to talk about water because that's, you know, a little bit inevitable. If you're wanting to grow food, you're probably going to be needing to hydrate it. There are some really cool dry farming systems out there. We're not really going to talk about that today because I really want this to be accessible. And for most of us, we're going to want to be able to, um, you know, irrigate our crops so that we can really have a system that, um, that works for us, that we don't need to go and kind of do all these specialty things. Um, and so for most folks, Folks, what you want to do is you want to keep a few things in mind, and this is regardless of if you're watering by hand, if you're watering with an automatic drip system, um, if you are using any other type of um, kind of standard technology to water, what you want to do is you want to keep in mind that water should be going directly to the root zone. Most plants, excuse me, most plants that you're growing, especially those annual veggie or fruit plants that grow really fast through the year, they're really gonna benefit most from that water going to the root zone. And they either aren't gonna benefit the uh, having their leaves wet or some of them really don't like it because of potential fungal disease issues. But even if it's not a problem to get the, the leaves wet, you really wanna make sure that you're targeting the water at the root zone because that is where it's needed to actually be taken up by the plant. So that's important to keep in mind. So even if you're hand watering, instead of just broadcast watering and not really knowing how far down the water is getting into the root zone, really try to get down there at the base of the plants, get that water down and explore. Kind of dig down and say, okay, I've been standing here watering for about a minute. Let me explore how far down into the root zone the water went. Does that seem about right? And if so, you can then move on. Um, kind of tied to that is learn the different root systems of the crops that you grow. And so what this means is something as simple as it's ready for, uh, it's time for you to, you know, maybe transition out a crop, go ahead. And even if you're going to leave most of the roots in the soil, maybe pull up one of those plants and take a look at the root system. And what you'll find is if you're pulling out something like a lettuce plant, it's going to have a pretty shallow root system compared to if you're um, pulling out something like a tomato plant or a kale plant. Those set really deep extensive root systems. And so once you start kind of teaching yourself or just observing and learning from what's going on with those root systems, that's going to help inform how you're going to want to water your different crops and the ones that have the deeper root systems like tomatoes and kale and uh, broccoli and all of those good things, you're going to want to water those 
deeper, but less frequently. You want the water to really soak down deep, and then you can kind of walk away for several days to even a week for some crops, and then do another nice deep watering. Whereas something that has a shallow root system, like a lettuce, spinach, um, even radishes, if they're the small kinds, they're not the big daikon, but like if you're doing just little spring radishes, those are relatively short root systems, and so you want to water those a little more frequently, but you don't have to do as much volume each time. You want to just kind of check and make sure it's going down the top couple inches, and then you're probably good to go. And you can maybe wait a day or two and then water again. So really understanding and observing how your plants are growing, what the root systems look like, that is going to really help you um, have that skill set naturally. You don't have to go look it up online. You can really just observe and then adapt your watering accordingly. I already mentioned the importance of mulching soil, keeping it protected so it can retain moisture, um, and then also leaving roots in the soil to act as that organic matter to feed the life in the soil. Um, and just one thing I wanted to mention, because it comes up when we talk about this, is um, the idea of collecting rainwater to use in your garden. Um, absolutely, it's wonderful to be able to collect the water that comes off of, you know, roofs and other impervious surfaces. Um, but when you were thinking about it in terms of incorporating that water into an edible landscape, you want to think about a few things. So number one is about how much water do I use during my growing season and how much water do I actually have the potential of collecting? How much water comes off the roof? Um, that's usually where we're collecting most of this water is off of roofs. And are those compatible? So do I have, not only do I have the phys physical space to hold the water that I've collected, but just how much, you know, how much runoff do I have the potential of collecting? And if you find that there, there's kind of a mismatch. It may not be worth your effort and your budget and your energy to set up, um, you know, collection. You might find another way to conserve that water. Um, for example, if you find that, you know, it's it's not really going to work out for you to effectively use your runoff water for um, enough of your landscape to collect it in cisterns, maybe instead you can just sink it on site by directing it toward a rain garden. That's a really great option that is still going to benefit the greater ecosystem, even if you're not putting it directly into your edible garden. Because I, I don't recommend that you grow food in a rain garden, um, because the idea of a rain garden is you're able to sink a lot of water that potentially could be contaminated or have pollution and those plants will help kind of clean it and help it sink into the soil. So it's still a beneficial part of your greater landscape. It's going to help you keep your overall soil structure hydrated. Certainly your trees are going to be able to tap into that water, um, but I wouldn't, you know, grow your actual veg directly in a rain garden. But you want to start thinking about what are the different options you have with that runoff and think about potential contamination how much time and energy can you put into um, maintaining and, and kind of just keeping an eye on that water? Because if you're wanting to use it directly on plants that you are gonna be, like where it's gonna touch the part of the plant that you wanna eat. So if you're using it on your root crops or on your greens or anything like that, you really wanna make sure there's no potential contamination. Whereas if you're just using it on things like your fruit trees and your, your perennials where it's not touching the part of the plant that you're gonna be harvesting, that's a lot safer bet that you can probably just go ahead and use it there. So these are just things to think about if you're looking at collecting water. Um, certainly not to discourage anyone. I just want to make sure that, you know, you've got information to think about. Okay, so just two more sections and then we're going to wrap up. Um, I really want to make sure that we are not just looking at our edible crops, but we're also looking at what other things in the landscape are going to help make sure that we have the support we need from beneficial insects, that we have a beautiful space, that it's, you know, it's not just a one hit wonder with like one or two crops, but we actually have a space that we enjoy and brings us um, a lot of satisfaction. Um, and how we can really make sure that it's also serving the greater um, ecosystem and that we're supporting um, native uh, birds and wildlife, that we're supporting insects, that we're really creating that ecosystem. 
Um, and so a lot of us are very familiar with ladybugs. They are fantastic to have in your garden. Now, here's the big thing with ladybugs. If you've never seen this before, on the right-hand side, that slide, that is a baby ladybug. It looks very different than the adult version of the ladybug, but it is what is going to consume way more aphids and pests on your crops than the adult. The adult can and will eat aphids and that type of, of pest, but the babies are the ones where that's really all they eat. They're gonna just chow down and do as much support for your crops and really cleaning up that pest population as much as possible. So you really wanna get to know your beneficial insects and what they look like at different life stages. So you can make sure that you're not only, you know, happy when you see the adult ladybugs flying around or eating an aphid, but you also know what to look for when that next generation comes out and is doing even more of the heavy lifting. It's also a great indicator that you actually have those ladybugs living their full life cycle in your garden because that's what you want. If you are relying on, you know, importing in beneficial insects like ladybugs in every single time that you need them in your garden, it's really not a great sustainable way to do things. So instead, you want to create the habitat needed so that those ladybugs can naturally spend their entire life cycle in your garden. And when a pest population pops up, they're already there and they're ready to go ahead and start laying their eggs and having their, their baby ladybug larva go to town on your pest, um, your pest issues. And so there is a completely separate two and a half hour um, free workshop through East Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District, all about beneficial insects. And I really recommend folks check it out. So what do they need in order to be able to do that and spend their whole life cycle here? And I'm not just talking about the habitat needs of ladybugs, but this, this really applies to a lot of different beneficial insects. Those could be pollinators, those could be predator insects that are going to eat your pests. Um, those could also just be insects that you enjoy seeing out in the garden or that are, are beneficial in their own way, whether you see it or not. They're just part of that ecosystem and that food, uh, that food web. And so here's really uh, the things that you're going to want to have as a minimum to make sure that you're creating a hospitable environment for these um, insects to have habitat. And so the first thing, of course, is food and water. I think this is where most people are, are pretty comfortable these days, the idea of a pollinator garden, of planting things that have different types of flowers and flower at different times. So you always have a food source available for insects that uh, use nectar and pollen. Um, you also definitely want to have some water available. Again, depending on where you're at, your summers might be different. Here in the Portland metro area, we get very little rain in the summer, and that's when insects and pollinators are really active. And so it's really, really important if you want those, those beneficial insect populations to stay nearby, you need to give them the water they need. And in particular, you want to give them, excuse me, safe access to that water. And so here's an example. This is this is exactly what I have in my garden. I have a few of them. And it's as simple as taking like a terracotta saucer, um, the kind you would have under like a terracotta pot. Um, it's nice and shallow. Uh, add some rocks at different levels. That's going to give your insects a chance to get down at that water. But if they get in a little too deep, they can scramble back out. So if you think of something like a bird bath, that's great. But that's really for birds because insects have a really hard time accessing that water safely and not if they fall in it's really difficult to get out because it's a big open you know body of water for them so you really want to have even if you have bird bass and that's wonderful if you do in addition you should really have some dedicated insect um, water sources as well and I like to point out that I actually really enjoy using um, terracotta like this because in the summer, I actually want this to dry out at least every couple days, if not every day, because that's going to break the cycle and make sure that you're not fostering mosquitoes. So sometimes folks want to use like a plastic one because it stays, you know, the water stays in it longer. It doesn't kind of drain out or evaporate out as quickly. And you can do that, but you're going to want to dump it every couple days and make sure that you're not fostering just kind of standing water. Um, so using the terracotta works because those dry out really quick. So the other thing you want to look at is, okay, the part of the year when these insects aren't actually buzzing around and pollinating and eating pests, 
where are they going to be? Do I have space for them to overwinter so that when the gardening season starts next year and pests start showing up, I've already got all of these insects already living in my ecosystem in my landscape. So generally what you're going to want is you're going to want to have at least one, if not a couple of dedicated areas that are undisturbed through winter and even pretty far into spring. Um, so that can be leaving leaves in certain parts of your yard. It can be having little spots where the soil is a little more exposed for those insects that might need some of that, you know, that clay soil or whatever that material is that they might need to go and, um, you know, plug up their uh, their egg holes and everything like mason bees they actually use mud to go ahead and pack between their eggs and that's what keeps them safe over winter so you want to have areas that are just undisturbed where you just let them be a resource to those insects and you don't want to clean that area up either at all if you have a few spots that can just kind of year-round just be really relatively undisturbed or at least wait until these insects emerge and that's usually not until at least you know, mid-March, early April. So you don't want to be out there cleaning everything up first thing in, when winter's over because you might be getting rid of all of those overwintering insects and that's kind of defeats the whole purpose. Um, so just as an addition, here are some more Pacific Northwest natives, but this time we're looking at um, those that aren't necessarily edible to us, but they're great habitat plants for different um, insects and birds and wildlife. Um, so these are just a few that you can incorporate in different areas so that you can really foster that habitat. And because we talked about zones before, I'll mention that habitat plants and those areas where you really want to make sure that you are not disturbing them and you are being able to overwinter and protect those different populations that you want, zone three is really great for that. So those zones where you're like, I don't know what I'm going to plant out there. I really don't pay too much attention to it. That's a great spot to make a habitat, like either a mixed habitat hedge where you have a bunch of different native plants that are going to kind of grow a little bit together and create that habitat. Or that might be where you have kind of a, um, a pollinator garden of natives that can kind of just go to sleep and be off, um, you know, out of sight and not really be, um, not really need to be cleaned up for your own aesthetic purposes. So that zone three is also a really valuable spot for habitat because you may find that you don't have any crops that would be well suited for zone three, but you could really build your habitat out there and then you know you're not disturbing it any more than you need to. Um, and then for this section, the last thing I want to touch on is companion planting. And what I like to really have people take away is not necessarily that you have to have like this plant must be with this other plant. That can be fun. There are lots of resources for folks talking about different plants going together. But the real takeaway with companion planting is that the whole, I, the whole reason it can be important is diversity. You're trying to make sure that we're creating layers, that we're creating diversity of um, food sources. This ties back a lot to habitat. A big part of why companion planting can be beneficial is because having these different plants can attract and support different benefits beneficial insects, different wildlife, um, and it can really just serve a lot of different purposes rather than having like, you know, a monocrop that has nothing under it but soil. Um, you can see in this photo on the left, this is actually a young broccoli plant, so it hasn't created a broccoli head yet, but it's on its way. And it has uh, two different companion plants kind of tucked under it. One is a marigold, it's a gem marigold. That's the bright yellow one. And those are really nice because unlike the really frilly French ones that are a little harder for insects to get in there, these are really good and open and easy for insects to feed from. And it's also paired with sweet alyssum. And so these make kind of a ground cover. It's kind of a living mulch that will protect that soil Oil under that broccoli patch and it's going to invite and support beneficial insects and it looks beautiful. So that's really the idea behind companion planting is not getting super hung up on this has to go with this, um, but really just that idea of how can I diversify the plants in my space, in my edible garden, um, so that I can have multiple um, services being performed by those plants. And we're just about to wrap it up. This is a pretty quick little section here because um, I want to save some time at the end for questions. 
Um, but a few kind of tips or things to think about as you are exploring how you want to make the most of your space and get a harvest as long in the year as possible. And so there are a few different things to think about. One is, are there certain things you can grow that you can preserve um, so that you can, you know, maybe enjoy it a little bit in the here and the now, but you can especially enjoy it over winter or early spring when you don't have a lot of fresh things coming out of the garden. Um, things like that would be like, if you want to do strawberries and preserve strawberries, get a specifically get a June bearing type of strawberry. Those are the varieties that really like to put out a ton of fruit all at once. And then they're probably not going to give you a ton of fruit the rest of the, the season, but they're really great if you know that you want a big batch of fruit so that you can preserve, go for one of those June bearing strawberries or something like rhubarb, really easy to kind of quickly process that into a syrup or to freeze and use later in the year. So think about that, how you might save or put away some of your harvest for later in the year. Um, think about varieties that are best for fresh eating versus for storage. So onions and potatoes are kind of the two big ones there are certain varieties that are really going to be at their best when they're fresh and they're not going to store very well. Those are things like if you like growing sweet Walla Walla onions, those really don't store well. So it's great to grow them. But if you know you want to store onions as well, make sure that you're growing both types. So grow a patch of your sweet Walla Wallas and start eating those first when they're out of the ground and harvested. And then grow at the same time, you can be growing some good storage onions, white onions, yellow onions that are good storage onions and even though you'll probably harvest those all about the same time, you can set aside the storage onions and eat those later once you've gone through all of those sweet onions. So think, think in that way when you're thinking about the longevity of your garden, how you can enjoy things outside of just the growing season. Um, and that's a really valuable way to kind of stretch your space and make the most of it. Just two um, slides left, I believe. Um, and so these are a couple things, again, to consider when you're thinking of how to be as abundant as possible. Um, one strategy is called succession planting. And that is when you take crops that are relatively short. So those are the crops that you planted. And usually within about two or three months, you're able to harvest that. Um, that would be radishes, beets, carrots, um, some of your greens and lettuces, things like that. Those are those kind of short to half season crops. Really, if you can break out of the idea that you only have one chance to plant those and you plant them in spring and then you're done for the year, if you can kind of set that out of your mind, um, and at least this is true for the Portland metro area, it might be different other areas where your growing season is different, um, but in the Portland metro area, we can definitely plant those types of crops, those shorter season crops, multiple times. And it helps you kind of stagger the harvest. So you're not just planting once, harvesting once, and you're just done for the season. But if you start planting your radishes, your carrots, your beets, and your lettuce in spring, go ahead and plant again later in spring, maybe a month after your first planting, plant another round of them. You're naturally going to be extending that harvest. And then start doing that again in kind of mid to late summer and you can start harvesting again in late summer early fall depending on what type of crop it is. So think about succession planting and just experimenting with planting at different times and not just once. And then the other thing is overwintering. So finding those cold and frost tolerant plants that you can put out kind of toward the end of the season, kind of mid to late summer, put out in the garden, tuck away, and you get to kind of ignore them through winter because we don't have a lot of pest pressure in winter. You don't usually have to water. Again, that's for our region. Um, so these are a great way to get a super early, early harvest before anything else that you could plant in spring. And this photo, I actually took this photo yesterday. This is my purple sprouting broccoli in my garden. And so I've been harvesting off of this broccoli plant for about the last three weeks or so. And it doesn't create one big head, but this plant was sitting over winter, it hadn't created anything but leaves. And then as soon as we started getting into these days where the light is out longer and we have a little more heat, now I'm getting all of these great little like broccoli, like broccolini type growths and um, quick and easy, super, super tasty and just such a great way for me to be able to harvest something when it's well before any uh, spring planted broccoli will produce. 
And lastly, um, two other things to think about. Uh, number one is collaborating with your neighbors. So if you have limited sunlight on your property, maybe what you can do, um, and, and you wanna grow things that need a lot of sun, maybe what you can do is find a neighbor that has more sun and you can grow things that don't need as much sun. So a lot of um, greens, for example, lettuces, spinach, a lot of root vegetables like radishes and beets, they can handle a little less sun than something like a pepper or a tomato. So maybe find a, a neighbor where you can each grow what grows best in your site and then you can share. Or if you're wanting to do perennials like fruit trees or fruiting shrubs, if it's something that needs a companion because a lot of them will need a different variety in order to cross pollinate, maybe find a neighbor within a house or two that is willing to put in a compatible partner for that plant and then you'll both get fruit from it. Um, so I think that is something excuse me, that's often overlooked. And then um, also lastly, considering chickens. It is not for everybody. It is not something to just go out and do on a whim. Um, but if you're really looking at how you can make the most of your site and how you can stack those different functions, so diversifying the things that are happening within your edible landscape, chickens are definitely something to consider because they can help reduce that food waste. You can kind of send that food waste through them and get an abundant source of fertility and manure from it. Um, you directly get the harvest of eggs. Um, they're really funny to watch. They are very entertaining. Um, and so there are different reasons why you might want to consider incorporating them into your edible landscape. But do do some research first. Make sure that you are prepared for the responsibility of it, but also know that there's a lot of benefit to it as well. So that's all I have for you today. Um, I'm right at time, but I'm happy to stick around if folks have questions. Thank you so much for your attention. I know we covered a lot and um, thank you also to Fix It Fair for this opportunity. Awesome, thank you so much, Lydia. So we actually don't have any questions right now, which does work because we're right, right on time. But I definitely <laughs> encourage folks if this is interesting to you, Oh, wait, we have one question. Perfect. Okay, someone just said slugs. I rent my apartment, so we can't have chickens or ducks. What's the best route for lessening the ravishing of plants? Great question, because this is a big, big issue here are slugs. Um, so two things I can say to that. Number one is get to know, just like I said, to really get to know the whole life cycle of your beneficial insects, get to know the whole life cycle of your pest insects. And the reason I say that is there are a lot of pest insects that if you know what their eggs or their egg masses look like, then you can take care of the issue before it really becomes a problem. So slug eggs are quite distinct. They're in little clusters. Um, they're very small. They're like the size of maybe like a BB. Um, but they're clear and they're clear or sometimes they're a little bit of like a creamy white color. Um, but if you can start really kind of looking closely wherever you see slugs, start exploring around that area and trying to find where you can identify any slug eggs. And that is going to be a great way where you're just going to prevent the whole next, you know, population boom of slugs by taking care and removing that, that cluster of eggs. So that's one thing that's kind of one approach to it. Um, the other thing is even without chickens or ducks, and I will say as a chicken owner myself, chickens can be disappointed with slugs. They don't love slugs. Ducks love slugs. So chickens are kind of take them or leave them. Um, but another thing that you can attract and support in your garden are garter snakes. And garter snakes are completely safe. They do not harm humans. Often, even if you've attracted them to your yard, you may never even see them, but they love eating slugs and slug eggs. And they really like, the habitat they like is to have areas that are undisturbed, especially if they have rock piles. So it doesn't have to be big, you don't have to bring in boulders, but just you know, collect rocks around your landscape, make a little rock pile somewhere that it can heat up and get warm. They really like that. And if you can make habitat for garter snakes, they will often move in and they'll help take care of your slug population. So those are two kind of strategies. One's on your own and one's kind of inviting some extra help in. Thank you so much, Lydia. That was a really like complex answer that covered so many different options for folks. So just wanna say thank you so much. We also have some great comments in the chat saying thank you. People really enjoyed the presentation. And I just wanted to remind folks that if you're excited about these topics, if you wanna see Lydia's full two and a half hour workshop, you're like, I need more. 
I just put that link again in the chat on Zoom. And if you're on Facebook, it's in one of the first few comments on there. And feel free to check it out. Lydia, thank you so much for presenting and Fix It Fair. We really appreciate you for having us on. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you, everyone.